Not long after Zarathustra started on his way, the jester from the marketplace sneaked up on him and started warning him. I'm gonna do something unusual in this video. Since we are encountering the figure of the jester for the second time, I thought it wouldn't be a bad idea to offer you a second interpretation. So I'm gonna depart a tiny bit from what I said about the jester in a previous video and give you a more conventional interpretation. In this second interpretation, the jester is an entirely negative figure. My aim is to point out that there are various interpretations, so don't be too dogmatic about any one interpretation. One thing Nietzsche wants us to do is to have our own understanding of what we read. With that in mind, let's delve into the text. Remember what happened in the marketplace. A tightrope walker was about to perform when a jester sealed his doom. Now, one could interpret the rope as representing one's life's journey, metaphorically speaking. But from another perspective, we could look at the tightrope walker as Zarathustra's first disciple, as the first person who opens his heart to what Zarathustra has to say. Based on this interpretation, the tightrope walker is a positive figure, whereas the jester is a negative one. There is a lot of evidence to suggest that what Nietzsche wrote about the marketplace had a lot to do with his relation with Wagner. The most crucial evidence comes from Wagner's autobiography. I'm gonna read you a passage from it. We lived in the marketplace, where I was often entertained by strange sights such, for instance, as performances by a troupe of acrobats, in which a man walked a rope stretched from tower to tower across the square, an achievement which long inspired me with a passion for such feats of daring. Indeed, I got so far as to walk a rope fairly easily myself with the help of a balancing pole. I had made the rope out of cords, twisted together, and stretched across the courtyard, and even now I still feel a desire to gratify my acrobatic instincts. This passage was written by Wagner in his autobiography, a work that Nietzsche was familiar with. How do we know that Nietzsche knew about this passage? Well, because we know that Nietzsche took charge of the negotiations for the printing of the first installments of the autobiography. He also most probably helped Wagner with proofreading the book. However, by the time Thus Spoke Zarathustra was published, Nietzsche had become a fully-fledged, independent thinker. So it is hard not to imagine he was indirectly attacking Wagner whom he was portraying as a tightrope walker. In the scenario, Wagner is being portrayed not as the first tightrope walker, but as the second one, namely the jester. The reason behind Nietzsche's attacks on Wagner is a long story for another time. For now, suffice it to say that, for Nietzsche, Wagner stood for everything that was wrong with German Romanticism. That is to say, nationalism, antisemitism, nihilism, populism, self-hypnosis, and so on. Based on this more conventional reading that I'm offering, the rope represents the bridge between man and the Übermensch. Accordingly, the tightrope walker was about to make a personal journey from the first tower, which represents man, to the second tower, which represents the Übermensch. However, a Wagnerian figure obstructs his path. So, while Nietzsche is representing Zarathustra as a sincere teacher that is meant to guide humanity on its path to becoming the Übermensch, he is reminding us that Wagner is a false teacher who uses his wiles and hysterionic talents to ensure the failing of human beings to cross over from human to superhuman. Furthermore, the jester can be seen as the personification of randomness and lack of meaning. This randomness and lack of meaning is what Zarathustra refers to when, in the seventh section of the prologue, he says, Uncanny is human existence and still without meaning. A jester can spell its doom. There is yet another way to look at the jester. In Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche suggests that if a philosopher wants to study the average man, he should debase himself and keep bad company. 
What he means is that the philosopher should be in contact with human beings who are lower than him if he wants to understand them. In the same passage, Nietzsche mentions the figure of a jester and calls him a cynic. He says, the higher man should listen to the cynical jester and congratulate himself every time the buffoon speaks up without shame, because the cynic provides a shortcut for understanding the average man. Now, let's read what the jester tells Zarathustra. Too many here hate you, the good and the just hate you, and they call you their enemy and despiser. The believers of the true faith hate you and they call you the danger of the multitude. It was your good fortune that they laughed at you, and really you spoke like a jester. It was your good fortune that you took up with the dead dog. When you lowered yourself like that, you rescued yourself for today. But go away from this town, or tomorrow I shall leap over you, a living man over a dead one. I want you to pay attention to the words good, just, enemy, despiser, and believers. These are not random words. It would be beyond the scope of this video to expand on each of these words. I'm just directing your attention to this cluster of words because you will encounter them many times throughout the book. But just to touch the surface, let's take the first word good. Of course, we as readers of Nietzsche know that in this context, this word doesn't mean good in the sense of being noble or the higher individual. Rather, it's the word the lower type of humans use out of resentment to refer to themselves as a way of distinguishing themselves from the nobles who are the real good beings in Nietzsche's view. Now let's look at how the jester addresses Zarathustra. He calls him the danger of the multitude. By now it should be clear that the multitude is a pejorative term for Nietzsche. It has the same negative connotations as what Kierkegaard means when he talks about the crowd. So without realizing it, the jester is actually complimenting Zarathustra by calling him the danger of the multitude. We also see that the jester tells Zarathustra that it was his good fortune that the crowd laughed at him. This line perhaps refers to Nietzsche's own life. His contemporaries mostly ignored his writings. If they had taken his words seriously and understood the message he was delivering, they surely would have roasted him, metaphorically speaking. As an example, evidence suggests that the cliché about how much upheaval Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy caused among the classicists is, to a large portion, a myth. In reality, they mostly chose to ignore it. Furthermore, the jester keeps telling Zarathustra to leave the town. It should be clear what's happening here. Zarathustra is being portrayed as an outcast. He is the individual who doesn't belong anywhere because he is independent. The price he has to pay for his independence is isolation. So to conclude the section about the jester, we can look at the jester as someone who does have marvelous skills. But ultimately, like Wagner, he is a populist, and he means to keep mankind from becoming superhuman. Before we leave section 8 of the prologue, let's have a brief look at the figure of the hermit that Zarathustra meets. Notice that this is not the first time Zarathustra is encountering an old hermit. We saw a similar encounter in section 2 of the prologue. Just like that section, the hermit is an ambiguous figure. He is not that black and white. For instance, although he shows generosity towards Zarathustra by offering him bread and wine, his act of giving is not entirely Nietzschean. For Nietzsche, giving should flow from overabundance. In other words, one should give because one is strong enough to give. It's not about material wealth, it's more psychological. In contrast to this view, we sense some sort of a reluctance and displeasure in the hermit's act of giving. Also notice the religious symbolism here. He is offering bread and wine. Furthermore, the hermit cannot distinguish between living and dead. What this scenario is portraying is that morality is not about the action in the consequentialist sense of the word. It's about the person. 
Finally, after walking around for some time, Zarathustra falls asleep, weary in body but with a calm soul. The message here is obvious. Zarathustra has a calm inner world, despite of what has happened to him in the external world. It's a message about resilience, 